about 20 minutes, maybe an hour worth of, worth of speak, and then uh, about three hours worth of questions. So uh, we're pretty fortunate for me to have you with us. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Joe Smith, his bio is included within the pamphlet I asked you to turn to it. For those of us who know Gerald Smith, you know what a, what a great he is, what a great friend he is, uh, and a true patriot. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I give you our 36th Over the last couple of years into force designs 
so that you can help spread the word. Because that's where we need the assistance, is in, is in getting the word out, getting our word out, not you know what somebody wants to write in this article or that article. Um, but what the commandant believes is, and has briefed Congress and the SEC death and gotten the thumbs up, yep, that's what I want, you keep going. So uh, I'll, I'll provide that to you in some very broad terms. First and foremost, it's based on a threat. The, the pacing threat is China. Uh, I'll stop the fact. The pacing threat is China. In the open source, uh, anyway, uh, in the open source, you're, you're seeing uh, hypersonic, potentially nuclear tipped weapon systems circling the globe. Minutes, which means your reaction time is limited. They didn't build that because they want to offer vaccines. They didn't build that as a delivery mechanism for food aid. They delivered, they built that as a threatening mechanism uh, to change the way that you live. So we have to keep reminding people it's based on the threat. When we talk about our Pacific posture, where we will lay down, and General Mahoney knows this all too well. The, the threat changes every year, so plans change. change. Plans don't change with the commandant. There's the plan, the Marine Corps plan. So, General Miller, General Berger, it's, things change based on the threat. So everything we're doing is based on the threat. You always have to go against the fastest runner. And people say, well, we're, we're not gonna fight China. God, I hope not. But if you do, you gotta be ready. You always run against the fastest runner. And for guys like that blow line here, China's not the pacing threat for everything, so I'm not going to see that's Russia. But you have to go against the pacing threat. So everything we're talking about, we don't have the option to say, ah, the, you know, that'll never politically happen. They'll never do this fight. That's not for us to say or anymore. We have to have a plan to execute in case it goes bad. The other piece is organic mobility. Or organic mobility is key. And th this is not setting up the, the fight between us and the Navy, but not. What I mean by organic mobility, aviation and aero class shipping. The Navy has a significant challenge now because they have to fund Columbia, Ohio replacement. Well, Columbia is the nuclear ballistic missile submarine that provides the, the nuclear deterrence under which we all sleep well at night. One of the three legs of the triad, right? And you can argue it, but the most survivable, useful leg of that triad is subsurface, subsea systems. That's got to be paid for. So that pressurization affects us. So you can't, uh, we have to acknowledge that there's other pressures on all of our DOD budget which are going to affect what we want to do for force design. So the need to, to source and support those systems that keep us all safe, amen. We still, as a service, have to have a sufficient budget that allows us to move forward with the force design and the commandant's vision, because it is in keeping with the joint war fighting concept. And the national defense strategy is being rewritten, will be out soon, and I guarantee you, we are in keeping with the, the national defense strategy, old and new. But again, because it's based on the threat. Threat didn't change. It's just getting faster and worse. Organic mobility again is vital. Without, uh, without the uh, L-class ships, the amphibious ships, we do not have the organic mobility that provides deterrence. You know, the force design is about making the Marine Corps a, what now we talk about integrated deterrence or conventional deterrence, but we do the conventional piece, right? If you don't invest in those systems, aviation, ground fires, but best long-range fires delivery platform, I, I, would, I would ask for a show of hands, but we're going to run out of time. The best long-range fires delivery platform, it's an F-35. I'll stop. And we are heavy invested in that as a nation. It's a phenomenal delivery platform. We also have ground-based fires, which shake it up. And it's, it's about having the MAGCAP, because we are still in MAGCAP, right near ground task force. Organic mobility, being able to self-deploy is what separates us from anyone else within the DOD inventory, and it's what gives us national sovereignty anywhere on the high seas. We have to have that capability that allows 
national and national leaders and combat commanders to put things off the coast and not have to ask for permission. It's a deterrence. If you don't buy the deterrence and you only focus on this very, very high end uh, fight, it's a fait accompli. You're going to drive yourself to the very high end fight because you didn't invest in what you need to deter. So the commandant said, hey, I, I think what we, we may do is our biggest contribution to May. And I emphasize May because there's a little bit of, of confusion there. Confusion, by the way, is there confusion? It's Pentagon term, marks are this. It's a combination of confusion and bewilderment, right? You add them together, you confuse me. And you get that sometimes in the building. The, the issue with Sustaining a deterrence is again, if you don't do it, you probably drive yourself to a fait accompli of the high end fight, which nobody wants, but somebody has to know how to do it. The things that we're doing with force design let us go from can let us go from competition to crisis to conflict. They're useful across all spectrums. We never said that we were the force that has uh, the heft and breadth to go to this location, that location, and go it alone. We enable and are enabled by the Joint Force. We provide the Joint Force commander with opportunities to de-escalate and when required to fight, because we do have lethality. We carry our lethality with us, but our, our biggest contribution may be, in the sense, make sense. Gain access to targets, hold targets at risk, and pass them to others within the Joint Force. Strike those which we can strike, and then pass it to others. Air Force, Navy, Army, allies, and partners. When you can do that, and you're the only ones who can do that, we believe we're the only ones. We are geographically blessed that we have 20,000 Marines west of the day line. Three meth, Stacy Clarity, General Clarity, has you know, any, any given day, yeah, give or take 20,000 Marines west of the day line. Some of them belong to Hazel. We've chopped some over. They're there. They're already there. They're just not organized, trained, and equipped to best handle keeping up with the basic threat and we're past that data. So when people say, oh, the Marines, you know, they're, they're passing data, they're not killing things. Oh no, we have the ability to strike things. That was let out publicly at um, Large Scale Exercise 21 in Hawaii when we, we publicly showed the naval strike missile off of a robotic vehicle called Rogue, and a thing called Syncex. We put a couple of enemy ship missiles in, in the unclassified form of today in excess of 100 miles onto the ship. In excess of 100 miles for the artillery, uh, Marines in a room, we were talking about 37 kilometers. Now we're talking in excess of 100 miles. Add that to the F-35s, add that to whatever may be next. Now you're at range that matters in the Pacific. And guys like Hank, uh, you know, who's logistician extraordinaire, just came out of third MLG. You know, Dave's natural next to him, logistician extraordinaire. They understand the, 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 the breadth of the Pacific, as does Mario Marquez, we just saw over here with his brand new hairdo. Um, that's a, let me hit you a couple things and I'll take questions. Um, Stand-in forces. Stand-in force is, it's, it's, it, it's two things. It's a unit, but it's a, it's a capability. When we say stand-in force, we're talking about that force that already resides within the enemy's weapons engagement zone. So not every unit is a stand-in force. You have to be organized, trained, and equipped in order to stand in. Meaning while you're in the weapons engagement zone of an adversary, you're capable of surviving, of passing data, and of striking. So we've organized, trained, and equipped, and we put you there with that mission. That's what a stand-in force is. It's not that complicated, right? It's pretty simple. We're, we're not a stand-in like EAB, Expedition Advanced Space Operations. We're not an EABO force. We're a force who can do EABO. We're not a stand-in force. We're a force who has stand-in forces who can go in and stand and sustain themselves in the Indo-Pacific. And the logistics is the longest pole in the tent there. It's wicked hard. We have to reduce everything from weight to power consumption to cost so we can stand in and spend money on sustainment. Because if you can't sustain yourself, you got a problem. Um, a couple of other things. A you, Marine Expeditionary Unit. People say, well, Marine Corps, maybe this force design thing has walked away from the crown jewel. Uh, General Gregson, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see you there. Sure, it's very good to see you. So uh, probably nobody knows uh, more about the Indo Pacific than uh, Lieutenant General Wallace Chip Gregson. Uh, if you go to the Three Myth Headquarters building, there's uh, there's a pretty significant uh, 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 she's a dog. Thanks for all the push on that. I remember which side of my elbow and my elbow goes, but I didn't keep out. 
Dr. Pat Spirit uh, dedicated the general direction for his service uh, there in Indo Pacific. Uh, he was the uh, FCG when I was the uh, tank commander of my group, and that was a very memorable moment for me because I got through it without getting fired, so I enjoyed that. Um, general direction did it really good to see you. So the MU is, is still the crown jewel, and we must produce it for the Vatican banner. Cut right through it, right? And I'm not trying, this is not trying to set up a food fight. And again, non attribution, we're not, because there's cameras going. I always joke non attribution and non retribution, not the same. <laughs> Lots of retribution for non attribution. A <laughs> U is a three ship R. It's three ship R. You can augment it. But what we, what we promise and produce and provide to the back commanders is a three ship R. Okay, that's what we all want to produce. So rather than fighting about it, what we do is we look for resources to produce that. But those expeditionary units, like the 24th unit that just came back, and I just talked to those warfighters that came back uh, from Afghanistan, they're all in. They need and deserve the tools to do it. And we need to make sure we have the appropriate L class to give them that. We've talked about reconnaissance, counter reconnaissance, or gaining and maintaining custody of targets. A guy named Frank Donovan, uh, who's the CG of 2nd Mardiv, he and Bill Journey, CG 2F, they got the football for the commandant to go make that a reality, to experiment, to hustle it, because he wants to export it, the experimentation piece, out of headquarters, Marine Corps, not necessarily, you know, it wasn't built here, so it's not good. Let the guys in the fleet have a, have a look at that. Let them run that, because it keeps them in the game, and it makes sure that, that the young Marines are the ones who tell us what the answers are. Some things are built at headquarters, Marine Corps, and everybody's going to have to get on board. Other things are built in the fleet, and headquarters, Marine Corps will have to support. And it's a 50-50 it's mix, or 60-40, depending on the year, but, but it's a mix. A couple other points. We talk about kill webs. And this goes to the point of the communication. We don't, we don't build kill chains. Kill chains can be not, you take one link out and it's done. We build kill webs, meaning once I put that data out there in the transport layer, which is very sexy, it's not something you can, it's, it's the lightning bolts on all your PowerPoint slides, right? Oh, look at the lightning bolt. Nobody, there's no constituency for the little lightning bolt. But there's billions of dollars that have to be invested in that. That without that, I cannot pass, pass data across the expanse of the Indo-Pacific or the globe at the speed of relevance and in, in the, the depth, right? There's certain target quality data that I have to pass. I've got to be able to do that with systems that many in this room build. I have to be able to do it at scale, meaning almost every room is a collector and has to be able to pass that data. A couple other ones uh, that I will say, and I, you know, without getting into classification, I'm going to be mindful here. The, the plan involves the reserves, more four reds, that John David Mellon, how to fundamentally change the reserves to best support, not the active, right? Reserves is more active now, to support the mission. We have one mission as the nation's 911 force crisis response force and the nation's stand in force, the force that can do stand in ops. Make sure I don't butcher my words here. It requires the total force. It's obviously always very politically sensitive. We start moving reserve units around. I understand that. But, but what we need is the flexibility to adjust multiple res. General Bellum is working this now very hard, both on the hill uh, and in the building, so that those Marines in multiple res are best trained, organized, and equipped to support the mission, ready to deploy. We have, a, we have a couple of legal requirements on the five to one as well, but we're reorganizing that as well. And then the final point that I would, would talk to you about is training and education and personnel. Those are now the commandant's two pieces of force design. Uh, General Stalker, good to see you too, sir. Um, I, I saw the invitation list, but as I'm making eye contact, unfortunately, I can still see that far. Um, I, I get to I finally figure out who, who's sitting where, sir, it's always good to see you. General uh, Stalker's daughter, by the way, was a real drum in my last house, so Bethany uh, is terrific. So, um, the best realtor I've ever had. I mean, uh, so, it is a small world. Training education, Lieutenant General Himes, and then manpower and reserve affairs, manpower. Okay. Uh, Lieutenant General Dave Eidemann. Those are his focus areas. And he's rolled this out. Uh, he's already talked about the, the, the future of how he sees manpower. We have to be more flexible. Now, let me be really clear. I'm pretty candid. Those of you that know me know I tend to just say what I'm going to say, and if I get in trouble for saying it, then I go to Florida Center, which is fine, right? <laughs> because book prices are doing nothing going up, and housing prices are going up, so maybe the sooner I get fired and go to Florida, the better, because I can afford, you know, an 1,100 square foot house instead of a 1,200. 
this is not about being woke. It's not about being, you know, politically correct and all that other stuff. And I'm using my proper language. It's about having access to the totality of American talent. You got a country of 330 million people, right? And this is on what people would call diversity, equity, inclusion. What we're saying is, I need access to everybody, right? I don't care if you're black, white. I don't care. If you're, you know, I, I used to say, I don't care who you sleep with. I don't care who you love. Is a better way to say it. If you're sleeping with somebody who is a subordinate, they yeah, I care. I don't care who you love. Train 30 million people. Once you whittle out those who are too young or too old to enlist, you're down very, very much below 330. If you exclude 50% of the population, or you exclude, say, 14% who are African American, or you exclude X percent who are Hispanic or Asian, you are in a business model that is spiraling in a death spiral. You cannot sustain that force. I need access to 100% of America's talent against the basic threat. So that's what that's about. When we talk about, I want to you know, do that, do diversity, have an inclusion. I want access to the whole talent pool so I can pick the best comptroller, the best fighter pilot, the best grunt, the best logistician. That's what it's about. It's nothing more simple or more complicated than that. All stuff. That's really easy. And then when you talk about retention, somebody says, well, you know, I've been in for 9, 10, 12 years, and I'm, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, starting a family, or this or that, and I, I need a year out, or something's going on. All right, sorry, I killed dog, you gotta get out. Wait, wait a minute. So, we're not a business, and I acknowledge that, right? However, you still have to take some of those principles. So, I've, I've looked at a person and invested in them for 12 years, and sent it to my finest human intelligence officer. And for the 12 year investment, two, three, four million dollars, whatever, for a year out, I'm gonna say, nope, you gotta go, suck it up, because yeah, we're Marines, you know, we're right. Um, well, we still got the Ura part, believe me, because the 24th New Marines right there, there was a master gun in there that looked like if he had looked at it wrong, he was gonna eat it. So I was very, very mindful and respectful of the master gun. Um, I don't wanna sacrifice 12 years of expertise for a year. That, again, not a business model that you can sustain. So he's trying to make things more permeable. Trying to think, make things more flexible. Because the first question we should be asking is if I look and I see Colonel Fry, that's Lance Colonel Fry, uh, call sign Chewy, and I say, hey, hey, Chewy, I decide first, you're who I want to keep. What's it going to take to keep you? So I want to say it down to, sorry, Dr. Long, you've been here for six years, time for you to go. Why? Because, you know, it's not really 12. I mean, if he, if he wants to stay there and we have a build it, stay there. Good for you, good for your family, and I keep one of the finest pilots in the Marine Corps. Well, that's all we're saying. So don't, don't think we're being all soft or anything else. We're saying, what's it gonna take to keep you? That's that's what the common driving toward with man power to affairs. <coughs> Pretty simple stuff. Dual service families, we got right here, probably the most senior dual service couple in the Marine Corps, uh, Colonel Schwenwald. Sean is senior by rank, married senior in every other regard. So, <laughs> sorry Sean. Um, but, you know, they were probably spending years in the Marine Corps thinking that the Marine Corps was PO to them for being dual service. Hey, man, you go down to Lejeune, you know, Sean will just be up in Northern Virginia. It's a, it's a short six hour drive for you as you're raising four girls. I mean, okay, not ideal. And we were fortunate to keep them, but the vast majority of their peers we did not. That's a bad business model. So, the two things that comments going after training education, and I won't believe that, that's for general honors. His focus area is now. Force design is on the move, it's going, General Hankel's got it, and we'll continue. And that's platforms, it's organizations, it's things, it's MQ9, Alpha Extended Range, and ground-based anti-ship missiles, and, and organization to be able to move quickly and lightly and get yourself in and get yourself out and move and be uh, survivable and be able to inflict damage and pass data. That's on the move. Hazel's got that. And, and I am 100 percent confident as long as we get the funding. General Mahoney's working that hard, hard, hard. We will be good. Now we're focused on how do I, how do I mature and keep the force that I've trained? How do I do that? And then on how do I train and educate them best? That is actually all force design. Rising tide floats all boats. That's all force design. Force design is not about gear or a table of organization. It's all of that rolled together. That's force design. So don't let anybody tell you oh, it's just about getting this piece of gear. It's about all of it, and the ability to support the joint force through organic mobility. C-130s, MB-22s, 53 kilos, amphibious shipping. It's all part of force design. And there's a mindset shift too. 
So I'm going to stop right there and take questions because I don't want to. I don't want to kill your time, but I, I get on this subject and go all day. Sorry about that. I'm happy you got on. Um, so I'm standing by for any questions. Fire away. Be hard. Chuck, what am I? How am I doing on time? I'm killing it. Okay, good. <laughs> I, I'm taking questions seriously. If you got them, fire away. I got time for Q and A. I'll answer anything. Joe Biden, yes, sir. Matt, you talked uh, talk briefly about the kill list. Um, we're hearing a lot from all of the services and the people that are involved in the kill list. Um, what are the services that are involved in the kill list? What are the services that are involved in the kill It appears that some of the services see that improved architecture will offset or mitigate a shortfall in the platforms. JFC2, convergence, or image. What is the link for staying and incorporating itself into the new architecture? So, Joe Biden, thank you for your question. Uh, so, the, the, I'm just going to go with that. So, the, the, the terms of Joe Biden was thrown out. Join all domain command control. What that means is all sensors, any shooter. Everybody's looking and you pass data, so the best shooter has an opportunity to engage the target. Uh, Project Overmatch is a Department of the Navy project to, to get us, the DON, the Department of the Navy, moving forward in the transport layer and the communications network. And then Project Convergence is an Army-led project to support JADC2. We're going to exercise that here in about a month, I think, uh, out at the uh, fact that Hazel and I are you going with me? Good. So Hazel and I go out there, you improve your ground. The, the Marine Corps, led by Lieutenant General Jerry Glady, we, we understand that we have to fit into that, not by buying a specific box, but we have to fit into it by the transport layer. What I mean by that is that whatever communications box, the radio that I buy, it must be able to communicate with whatever General Clinton has in the Army. I don't have to buy the same box, but can it accept the same waveform? 100% committed and can it, does it have the capacity to pass whatever target quality data is? How many lines of code I have to pass between us and every other service and our allies and partners. So we're not just committed, but required to do that. Because um, what we don't want to do is go back to square one and buy brand new everything. If I can retrofit something, you know, uh, look at a Chad Raven, who, who, who is kind of the master of all things that are uh, common air command control system, small form factor, um, that take what you already own and make sure the transport layer works between everybody's system. Otherwise, I gotta go back and retrain. And for the brain, he or she doesn't care. You know, I mean, some of the super smart cop guys do, they understand it, but the waveform, you know, you speak great to me when you're talking waveforms, and you know waveform or whatever. I just want it to pass from the unit. So I don't know if that answered, but we are fully committed to, to JADC2, the concept, and then ensure that the passage of data and the security layer that's required is sufficient. What I, what I know is what's produced by the cloud, people get nervous by the cloud, your stuff's up in the cloud. The, the reality is that it's way more secure than what we have right now, and we have to make it even more secure. It's more secure than what, what we organically produce. And General Hancock, yes sir. I want to fire your position a little bit. Hey sir, I want to see if we, we did pack century uh, out on the, on the West Coast, whole integrated third fleet line, the whole nine yards. In addition, Roger Turner down at uh, Blue Diamond during the uh, this tonight. We got down to the point where we were completely waveform agnostic and we were challenging the, 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 the MSCs and MONOSIS to move how big we wanted. We wanted to strip down the pieces of information. So instead of a gig, we're moving two kilobytes. And if it broke the threshold, we stopped it. So th this is really happening from time to time now. And I don't know if you, because the, the third model is critical in that, but so we're just kind of do some support by fire here. We, we're doing that in the fleet now. We've got a long way to go, but again, you know, way for that cost for sure. And finally, I'll close with some other questions. Hazel, thank you. The, the piece that you just talked about, about what I'm going to transport, there are joint standards being worked by a Marine Lieutenant General Dennis Crawl, the J6, that says, this is target quality data. I'll stop. Declare your statement. Well, here in the first part of the or the 82nd Airborne, no, uh, -uh no. This is target quality data. You're clear. That's what you get. Well, the way I like to work here in my community, well, I'm mildly interested. This is joint target quality data, all stop. We've never done that before, but this is where the joint force is imposing uh, underneath Joe Hyden, uh, the 
vice chairman to impose some, some very, very much needed standards so we don't all go off on our own thing. What else? Fire away, anybody? Hey, sir. Um, hey, Jim. Thank you for coming. Uh, question as it relates to the Marine Corps' direction and vision with force design in conjunction with the Navy uh, and the Navy's distributed maritime kind of goals in the future. So, some analysis uh, shows that the Marine Corps is on a better path, a more uh, targeted path toward the EABO construct and, and is, is better positioned to get there in the time that, uh, that you lay out, whereas the Navy, because it's, it's a lot more complicated, a lot more money floating around, a lot more, more expensive weapon systems, platforms, etc., that they, it's a lot fuzzier picture for them to get there. So how do the two paths converge? Given the tight integration, but also the, the disparity maybe in the in the uh, rate that you're going down those paths. Yeah, so the, the, the naval enterprise is, is just that it's naval. Look, we are naval. That's who we are. We're the fleet marine force, not the MMF marine marine force. We're the fleet marine force. Always have. Been. So the navy's worked on that hard. They have some incredibly large bills to pay. They have some incredibly complex and expensive systems. So I think we are much more agile because we're smaller, a little bit less expensive, but we have to be in concert. So General Heckel working with his counterpart, the M9, uh, the M9, uh, Satan Khan, and then me working with the Vice Admiral, or Admiral Lesher and the Vice CNO. We are trying to stay exactly in step, but there's always going to be dissonance in the force, you know. And, and for the retired general officers that are here, there's been a dissonance in the force, that, you know, once it comes down to budgeting, we're all in on distributed maritime operations, and the Navy's been working that hard for how to do DMO, which we support. Um, when it gets down to who's going to get this last dollar, well, of course we're going to fight. I mean, wow, stunning, you know. And if there's a, if there's a soldier, then we're going to fight. First, we're going to fight the soldier, then we're going to fight between ourselves. Um, so I, I, I try not to confuse the budget fight versus the concept of deployment fight, which we are in violent agreement with the DMO being able to disaggregate your forces, whether it's an expeditionary strike group, a carrier strike group, and then pull it back together and insert it at the point in time when you're choosing, enabled by Marines, enabled by the Joint Force, that's DMO. And the, the power projection piece, to be able to get those forces in, there's this argument that I could also use this particular body's help in, there's an argument that's brewing about survivability, as if it's a binary thing. These things are survivable, these things are not. Well, look, if, if, it's like a piece of glass, right? Oh, this thing is hurricane resistant. Well, if I drop, drop a two-ton boulder on it, it's going to break. So at some point, you know, you, I can make anything breakable. I mean, you know, give me a lance corporal, and I'll, he'll break anything. <laughs> so you, you got to be careful. We make things more survivable when we do these things. They're more survivable if we employ the joint force. And we're not just going to go out there and, you know, hey, diddle, diddle, run up the middle. We're going to use all the joint forces to make what we have more survival, as is the Navy, as is the Air Force, the Army. So we are in step on distributed maritime operations. Much more complicated problem for the Navy, building Columbia, carriers, the whole bit. Um, but what I would say is what we can't lose in that is that's the high-end fight, which I acknowledge, and we have to, as I said earlier, we have to be ready to do it. But in the 85 to 90 percent of the time, you spend the rest of your life, which is competition. We view it as competition. China views it already as conflict. Right? We have to have organic mobility to deploy ourselves globally to prevent the last 10 percent. That's the whole point. But we, we are actually much more in step than I, I think most people would think. Anybody else? Fire away. No, no, no offense taken. No cheap shots. Yes, sir.
fairly small for now. I will say this, and this will scare everybody. When the Marine Corps resizes, everything's on the table. The number of JLTVs we buy, the size of Marshall, everything's on the table. The Marine Corps has to be balanced across the map path. And that would include what we provide to the Joint Force, the number of staff officers. When the Marine Corps changes, everything has to change. But MARSOC is stay what we get a tremendous amount from them. Uh, they're a great experimentation bed. As, as General Heckel uh, now has the warfighting lab uh, under him, they, the MARSOC Marines are doing quite a bit for us, not just in reputation and, and in defense of the nation, but for us to be able to experiment. As far as the Special Forces Magtas, I'll be very candid, um, we have to get, they have been successful, but we, we cannot continue to do things outside the priority theater. So the priority theater is China. That is that's economically in the threat. That is if you, the last national defense strategy, and again, the new one's not out. But if that's the basic threat in the, in the priority theater, it can only be the priority theater if you put things there. So if we continue to put assets in other theaters at the expense of the priority theater, then we're peanut butter spreading. Uh, for those of us that go you know, for the infantry in the crowd, you have a machine gun section, it's going to first, second, or third platoon, not everybody. So who's your main effort? Main effort's first platoon. You get the machine guns. Second and third, they're going to hate that. Because they still got an enemy, and they're still losing wins. I get that. But if he's the priority, he gets the machine guns. Indo-Pacific is the priority. So we have to get our resources there. And if we don't have enough to do everything there, then things like Special Purpose Magtabs, while highly successful, uh, we have to evaluate, are they in the priority theater? Are they the best use of limited resources? But they have been incredibly successful and Herculean things done by C-130 pilots, B-22 pilots, the Central Command Marines who have done phenomenal work way outside their weight class. Uh, does not in any way, shape, or form diminish what they did. We're going to have to make very hard choices in the very near future about who gets limited resources. I'm doing my time, Chuck. I got 12.50, we good? Okay, take another one. Yes, sir. I'll be, I'll be as good as I can. I'm from Texas, so I come by honestly. If you ask me how's the weather, that's a five minute conversation. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this, this is a relatively quick one. So, the way you characterize organic uh, mobility is very similar to the way the Commonwealth spoke. We talked about sustainment. And it needs to be, it's a critical requirement, and it's uh, also a critical loan ability to do LOCE, EAPO, uh, DMO. Can you talk to how? Uh, Sure can. Um, and I got one follow up for, for myself. I, you know, uh, there's a lot of hamster wheels going up in there. None of them are very effective, but they're always spinning around. So I got one more thing I got to follow. Logistics. The, the, the first way, the first requirement for logistics sustainment is need less stuff. And we've heard the Commandant very wisely say that. And by the way, I don't get a fit rep anymore. So when I say that, I'm not like, you know, kissing up. I don't get a fit rep. Uh, it's nice. I just get. I get told to go home. But again, <laughs> I'm at like 80, what am I, I don't know, what am I doing? 90% of my retired pay, that's, that's not really a threat right now. Okay? When they say it's time for you to go home, okay. Anyway, <laughs> my project go. Um, first, you got to need less. Need less, okay, plenty of water in South China Sea. Reverse osmosis, water purification units are very small, but they still require gas, so that's the long pole in the tent. But we have mechanisms to deliver gas. There's also plenty of gas in the first island chain. There's plenty of food in the first island chain. There's wind power in the first island chain. So again, this goes back a little bit, side comment. When we talk about re renewable energy and climate change, it's not about being woke, right? I mean, look, I'm all about polar bears. But what I care about is that the Marines don't have to carry as much stuff. That's what I care about. And in fact, the polar bears are doing great. That's super, you know, happy to take a tour of the Northwest Passage one day and retirement and see the polar bears. But what I care about is that young Marines, like my own young Marine, has to carry less stuff and is more survival, more sustainable. So first, you need less. You can do expeditionary foraging. And I've said before, it doesn't mean the Marines are out there with a 10 cup bag. It means that they're using what the terrain has to offer. You produce your own water, you use solar panels, wind power to produce the power to run the reverse osmosis water purification unit, so you don't need gas. 
And then that leaves you free to transport lethality. So General Heckel's working along with General Weiser, Deputy Commandant for Aviation, and he's working the next generation of logistic uh, unmanned vehicles. They can focus on just moving missiles, ammo, lethality. The, the key things that you need, construction materials, some of them. All right, that was bad. I mean, I think there's a battery going on. Uh, I'm running out of time. The, you need to leave, need less, and that even goes all the way to construction materials. It doesn't have to be perfect, it has to be expeditionary, useful right now at this time. Because what I can build and do and use right now for roads and bridging, uh, refurbishment or fixing, that is useful now. Waiting 15, 18, 20 hours of no use. So the first thing is to need less, and some of the experiments that General Heckel's got going on with DARPA uh, and with Office of Naval Research are getting to exactly that. So you need less. Because the Army owns theater sustainment command. But you can't just say, well, hey, Army, feed me. What if they actually can't move you? Well, they should. Well, that's great. What about the land school? Was there forward? Well, the Army's supposed to provide. Yeah, but they physically can't. Well, that's their problem. You, you can't do that. And that's where the building fights over budget is completely unhelpful. You gotta do something to help yourself first. Does that sort of answer? Okay, the final piece on that. This sort of the last one, the final piece I was gonna hit on is it's on, on thought. Look, when I was in, and this goes back a little bit to diversity, equity, inclusion. Hey, I'm looking for diversity of thought. I make sure I echo the commandant's uh, comments. When I was a, a division, a regimental, and a battalion commander, my air officers, I, I didn't let them wear candies. They had to wear their flight suits, they had to wear their bags. I don't want you becoming a grunt because you think differently about problems as a pilot. So wear your flight suit because you think differently. I want, I want somebody who thinks differently, who throws weird ideas at me. If, if we all have the cookie cutter solution, that is really easy for an adversary to figure out what I'm going to do. Because, you know, they all do the same. Like Russian doctrine, one of the, way, one of the ways you can actually deal with it, they actually follow it, right? Us, we have doctrine all through the 80s, and, you know, General Briggs and those, we didn't follow our own doctrine. I mean, it's kind of hard to figure out. We need people who think in some fairly different ideas, fairly radical ways. Because if you don't have that, you're easy to figure out from the threat. So this is all about war fighting. It's not about being PC or anything else, about war fighting. Yes, sir. Oops.
the stuff you're talking about, so the geopolitical explanation for things that are going on, language, all that is underneath Lieutenant General Himes, who's only been in the seat now for, gosh, how long has he been in there now? Yeah, just a few months, maybe tops a couple, three months. So uh, we had Lieutenant General Frank Barack was the first, he got it up and moving. So now we have Lieutenant General Himes, so he'll be there for a couple. So that is the Commandant's, one of his two new priorities. His priorities were force design, and then sub elements were personnel and then training and education. The training and education piece has got both an increase in their senior leadership, their total number of personnel available to do those resources, and then we got to work on their budget so that they actually can do the things you're talking about for training, not just our officers, but our staff non commissioned officers who are going to be leading some of these EABs. We're not going to have a major in charge of everything. We're going to have start, you know, people that are gunnery sergeants, staff sergeants, who are more than capable of handling it. But the other piece, we've got some PhD programs. General Flynn's son in law is actually getting a PhD right now at Texas and m Fine School of America, I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> and we have begun to invest in that out of a limited number of dollars, but we have begun to invest in that. It, it will not be fast enough, but we are focused on it. I think I'm getting the high sign because it's 12.59. Look, um, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, my only parting shot would be please take the information that's provided and, and dispel rumors, write to the Gazette, write to the Leatherneck, be part of the discussion, be part of the fact-based discussion, talk to me, talk to General Heckle, talk to General Klingon, if you're not, if you think you're getting bad scoop, because what I told you, that's pretty much gospel scoop, um, and don't let the other things, uh, other, other Marine Corps doing this or that, I, I'm standing right here, you know, this is I, my reputation staked on it. What I said, that's force design. And if you hear other things, you can say, hey, I just had lunch with Eric Smith and he said, you're full of crap. You can say that because this is force design. And if you don't do it, you're getting out based by the threat. And you're not going to like what 2030 looks like. So thanks for letting me come uh, eat lunch with you and chat for a while. Uh, I got a couple minutes I can chat after and then I. I do have to go back right over the floor to serve the night plan and then retire without the band. Um, but thanks very much to Josh Rogan and to the foundation and to all those who uh, put this together. So thanks very much. I enjoyed it. Thanks.
It's not a different generation of people that are aliens. It's our children that we're trying to keep in the Marine Corps today. And if you have raised children, and I'm talking to this group, they're different than we were as kids. They're different as we are as Marines, sailors, and service members. But what the capacity there is, and this is part of the training and education piece, is the investment we're going to place in our place. We're we'll talking in the future. We are already investing in what it's going to take to develop the mental acuity of the future fighting force. And I'll offer one example, and it's, it's amazing sometimes. We'll develop a new data system, and we'll say to ourselves, okay, these Marines are going to break this thing. As we try to ask the same people, I got this new phone, can you like, which app do I use to like call? And we're afraid they're going to break this new multi-million dollar piece of equipment that they have developed, and they have lived in this world. I use that because that's the way we're training the force of the future, is teach them, mentor them in the ways that they have been raised, educated, and mentored. There's a whole lot in that explanation, sir, but what I can tell you is, is the majority of the commandant's focus is not on the things. The majority of the commandant's focus is not on the missile. The majority of the commandant's focus is on the human beings that have to employ, think, maneuver, uh, act, be ahead of the game, that's assisted by some of these things we're talking about. Training and education and manpower modernization, if there's, every, if there's three things, if it's the stuff, the other two-thirds of that equation are the people. And that's all between the ears, sir. So thanks for the question. I hope that helps round it out some, sir, but thanks for the opportunity. So uh, we got uh, two birds with one stone. And now we don't have to put on another lunch. OK. Uh, <laughs> so Major, thank you. And I do apologize. I do, I'm trying to turn on a very efficient organization. That, uh, uh, so Major, I apologize for throwing you in the bus. But having heard him for the last three years talk about this, this very simple issue, I thought it would be worth uh, calling you this. General Maxwell, sir, I forgot to, I neglected to call you out when you came in, but I'm calling you out now and embarrassing you. General Maxwell's here today, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so thanks, David. Dave, Dave is uh, the Deputy J4 for the Joint Staff. Thanks for being here. And if I didn't say that, Mary would probably kill me. She passed me about three notes when we were having dinner. So. I hope that you found this conversation today between, by our two senior leaders uh, valuable. This is what the association does. It brings in this talent, uh, this leadership, to inform all of us on where the Marine Corps is and where it needs to go. Uh, our next panel, which is going to be on 1 December, uh, is, the, is the first of the first, is the information panel, and I'll co-host that with uh, Lieutenant General uh, Glavy. I think you will find that of extreme value. I invite all of you to come. Uh, Chaplain, you're done. You're, you're off limits. You're going to have too much for your child. But everybody else can come. Uh, and I want to just thank you all again for supporting the association, uh, for being here, taking your time, and uh, wish you safe travels to wherever you're going. Thank you very much.